Oh, I bet I know why this is going so slowly. Because we're on the same network? No, because it was trying to install a Java update. Is it done installing Java? Apparently, because it just said your update for Java has installed. Is your computer full of coffee? Oh, I wish. That would be the best. Welcome to the Spin Dash Live, our very first episode of the post episode that we're doing here that is now technically, I guess, a new series, but a spin off series, but no, the actual series. Hey, this is the Spin Dash only. We're doing all the episodes live now, and it's just easier than numbering them and pretending that I haven't been away for about a year and a half. <laughs> that sounds like a good plan. So this is the Spin Dash Live for February 2016, recorded on February 18th, 2016. It would have been funnier if it was in uh, 2015, actually. Uh, it potentially could have been funnier, but it also would have been timely as well. Mm, that's true. And we can't have that. So we, we've got a plethora of hosts this week. Uh, we've got our ever stalwart... Oh, I would call myself a guest. Uh, everyone's a guest. I'm a guest. He's a guest. You're She's a guest. a guest. Everybody's a guest. I guessed so. <laughs> the uh, confident voice you hear there is our good friend, Evil Dr. Reef. Well, hi there, buddy. That feminine voice we hear over there is Saber Pilot. Well, hi oh, there, hi buddy. Hi, guys. Oh, you meant her. Okay. Hi there, buddy. And the mature, aged voice that we hear in the background is uh, Jason Berry, <laughs> writer for Sonic Stadium and host of Sonic Talk. Hello, how you doing? I'm a middle-aged old man. And I'm the host of Sonic Talk, yes. Thank you very much. Indeed. And you are a co-host on I this. am the person who attempts to ruin it as best he can. Mm-hmm. Successfully, might I add. <laughs> so, uh, this week we've got the Star Post, and we've got our Spin Cycle. In our Spin Cycle this week, we are talking about a lot of quotes that have happened recently. It's a good way to catch up on what Sonic has been doing by just taking a look at, hey, Izuka said a bunch of things to Polygon, and then someone on a message board said a bunch of things about the Sonic movie. Let's talk about that <laughs> in some sort of vague framework. <laughs> oh, jeez. We've got our traditional spin box and blast processing. Uh, cutting out a little bit of the fat just so that, hey, spin dashes are going to be quicker, easier, and more frequent to get out. By which I mean hopefully monthly. So over in the Star Post this week, uh, Jason, it looks like you've got um, the uh, early release game from Disney. Uh, you've got an early release game from Capcom. And you've got uh, Konami shilling insurance. What would you, would you like to talk about? Oh, uh, <laughs> okay. First off, I uh, I don't normally do a Steam early access, but for some reason last month I actually have two early access games I ended up with because one of them was emailed to me was uh, Disney was talking about Tron Run, which I love Tron, so you know I wanted to check that out, and it was an early access game for nine ninety nine, which. Has now been released since last Tuesday at the price of nineteen ninety nine. If you didn't get in, or forty dollars if you want all the downloadable content. <laughs> <laughs> right, and surprisingly, for those of you who are wondering what Sanzaro is doing while the delay of uh, Sonic Boom Fire and Ice is going on, they are the developers on this one. It's kind of an auto runner, like you would see normally on an iPhone or uh, Android, you know, device. But it's a full-blown PC game. It's got uh, ten levels of you uh, running, jumping, sliding on walls, doing all this other stuff, and then ten other levels of doing a light cycle race where you have to try to beat the timer and gain more time, and then a uh, endless runner mode where you just keep going for as long as you can. Now, you say auto-run, but um, we're, we're not talking something as simple as, like, Temple Run, right? No, that I think the reason I don't know if this is the you know truth or anything, but I think they probably set this out to be a, a mobile game, and they got a little too ambitious <laughs> for it or something, because it does have a lot of different button motions to it. You're using at least three or four buttons, plus a 
combination of things. They're also using the, one of the LNR triggers. So it's a bit more sophisticated than your average Temple Run Sonic Dash type of game. I mean, game. It, it looks like you're not actually running on tracks per se. Are you actually controlling your position? Are you controlling it almost a little bit more like a racing game? Well, yeah, in the, in the light cycle, you definitely are, because you're going forward and you're going left and right. And here, you have pretty much full control of your character at the time. The only thing he's doing that you have no control over is he's running forward. From your perspective, obviously, you didn't have to... You got in early. You didn't necessarily right. have to pay the current asking price. Do you think it's worth the $20 they're asking? And then following up on that... Would you be willing to pay the ten or twenty more for additional content for it? Uh, twenty dollars is a bit high, I'd say. Uh, I'm glad I got in when it was ten. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I I enjoy Tron, and this is this is not a bad you know Tron game if you're a fan of that right, series. Right. It's definitely not that bad at all. But tw- there is not hardly that much content at all for twenty bucks. Mm. If if the rest of the DLC were free. Then maybe that would be okay, but twenty dollars is a bit steep. Ten dollars was the right price, I think, for this. Mm. That, that's that's a little unfortunate. Although, I guess the uh, other hand of that is that it's Steam and it will be ten dollars about four times a year. <laughs> right, or five dollars, or two dollars, depending so, on how well it sells. Ninety nine cents. <laughs> so it looks like you also wanted to give a, a couple shout outs to. Um, I guess Metal Gear Solid and something about Gamefly? Okay, yeah, I mentioned that. Okay, (laughs) I finally canceled my Gamefly subscription that I've had for about 10 years. And the reason being is, back in the day, it made more sense for me because there was, like, Blockbuster video and Hollywood video going on, and uh, renting a game would cost about $6, and you'd get, like, three days' worth. Whereas through Gamefly, um, they always had a Los Angeles office, so I usually got my... Uh, when I returned the game, I got a new one within 48 hours. Oh, okay. Which was great. And I could keep it as long as I want. But now with, uh, Redbox and with a lot of game deals going mm-hmm. on, I don't rent as often as I normally would. Or when I rent, I'd go, f- I just go to Redbox and try it out for a day and see if I like it or not. Right, right. And with Metal Gear Solid 5, I actually rented that back in September. Went through the, the first level, which is kind of a horror style level where you're trying to get out of this hospital while the enemy's trying to kill you and it turns into this real violent debacle. Mm-hmm. Uh, the rest of the game isn't like that at all. It's actually an open, how could I put this, espionage type game where you're going through different missions in Afghanistan and Africa and stuff. And there's some silly stuff to it too, which makes it kind of fun. But what I like about it is that it's an open world Metal Gear Solid where you can approach it from different angles depending on which missions you take on but the thing is i didn't start doing playing that portion of the game until last month because i had so many other games going on for so for like six months i'm playing playing i'm paying a uh, 18 dollars a month for this uh, game to just collect dust in my home so finally i got sick of it i just i bought it used from gamestop and returned the gamefly one and just canceled it out because i realized as long as I keep the subscription, I'm just wasting money. Yeah, that's yeah, that makes fair. perfect sense yeah. to me. So we're gonna we're gonna keep moving on, keeping up the pace. Uh, but before I do, I have one quick question, Jason. What is the stupidest thing you've attached to a balloon so far? But mostly, you just you like horses and animals, and I just love the when you attach them and they shoot off in the direction you always hear them <laughs> screaming. Excellent. And uh, the the one the one thing that always bothers me is I now have a wolf companion. Wait, what's his what's his name? What's his name? It doesn't have a name, I don't think. Oh no, it's D Dog. His oh. name's D Dog. Yeah, D Dog. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, you have D Horse, D Dog, uh, D Walker. Oh goodness! I love quiet. I love you, Kojima. <laughs> Good <But> times. The, <laughs> poor dog. D Dog is not too bright. I I one of the things you have to do is get intel from the enemies. So what I do is I'd. Knock him out with a tranquilizer dart. Then I'd go over, and what I want to do is I want to kick him to wake him up. And then uh, while they're groggy, I grab him from behind and get some intel out of him. The problem is my dog keeps following behind me, so I go to oh. kick him. I end up kicking my dog in the face. <laughs> oh, out. oh like, man. man. Animal cruelty. So, poor guy. So, Saber, uh, tell us about your adventures of kicking dogs in the mm. face. Actually, I haven't. Okay, I can't say that. I actually have, but it was an accident. I've been 
As I had predicted, uh, as soon as it came out, I kind of fell into the wondrous maze that is Fallout 4 uh, as soon as it came out. I was lucky enough to get one of the Pip-Boy editions, which I still have not played with the Pip-Boy because I'm too afraid I'm going to break the dang thing. Uh, but I have been, I've put in probably, I think the last I checked, it was four or five days worth of hours into the game so far. Jeez, you're making me feel good about my time with Xenoblade. <laughs> But um, I that that's pretty much been my rabbit hole, I guess, for the past. Uh, I guess it came out in November. <laughs> so so what what's what has been your take on Fallout Four? Like, what have you liked about it? What have you <sighs> Fallout had Four? With? I there there are a few nitpicks that I will say the um the system for dialogue is really really bad. Instead of actually saying what you're going to say, it gives you a generalization, and then you pick it, and you it may not even match what the generalization actually was, but somebody who was doing the dialogue thought it did. Um, the nice thing is you don't have to worry about uh, weapon wear in this one, which is kind of nice, but there's more customization. And the other thing that's kind of weird is that you now are looking after basically the rest of the post-apocalyptic world in that you have to take care of settlements, so that means I have to take care of settlers, which means I have to do things like find out if somebody doesn't have enough water or if they don't have enough beds or if they're happy or unhappy. And when somebody gets kidnapped, I have to go and get them back. Just like Animal Crossing. Now, now you got the uh, you were one of the uh, purchasers of the season pass, right? Yes, and I got it before. If If you're listening to this now, I don't know if you guys are aware, but they actually added more DLC. If you don't purchase it by March 1st, the price is going from 30 to 50. Right. Uh, I think they've kind of upped the scale of some of the stuff that they were planning yeah. to do. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a lot of the early packs are going to be related to your it'd be like your house building or your village mm-hmm. building, is that accurate? Yeah, that the first one that I saw that's coming out I think in March, I think relies heavily on the customization and and that's kind of good. It's just that there's there's one specific character, and he's a wonderful character by himself. You can have him as a companion, but anytime the game just it, it, it's like having those dirt quest in M- MMO. You'll always have the one person who has another job for you that you don't want. Hmm. Every time you see him, there's somebody else has been kidnapped, oh, or s- and uh, their village is under attack. I I or, see what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> And I feel bad because he's a good character and it, they were coming from the right place. But the problem is, like, you can see how many quests you've done, you know, period. And he's the leader of the Minutemen. And, like, story quests, I've got maybe, like, five or six of the main story quests. I've done, like, 50-something <laughs> Minutemen quests. For God's sakes, learn to frickin' take care of yourselves. <laughs> yes. Or maybe the settlers should do something. <laughs> so... Uh... Uh, Reef, it looks like you have a couple games, one I'm familiar with, one I don't think I've even heard of. So, uh, what's your, uh, pick of play this week? The, uh, the other thing actually isn't a game. So I put on my list, uh, the most recent David Bowie album, Black Star. And just cause I kind of wanted to mention that cause, uh, unfortunately David Bowie did pass away last month, but, um, that, that album, if you're a fan of, uh, modern music, I'd say that's a, a really good album to pick up because it's definitely very experimental and um especially the first track, it really tells a story. And I think what <laughs> I liked the most about it was that uh you can kind of go back and look at the album and the lyrics of the songs now and you can tell that he kind of planned this, that he knew he was going to be passing away. So he kind of told this last little story of his. So I thought it was really very artistic and I liked it a lot. So that's just something I wanted to mention. Um, but the game that I put on my list that is actually a game is Invisible Ink. And it's apparently becoming very popular now. I, uh, I know a lot of people that have been playing it recently. And if you don't know what Invisible Ink is, it's, uh, really like a, a turn-based stealth strategy game. And the premise is, is that you're going and infiltrating, uh, various buildings around the world trying to, uh, uh, survive as a spy organization. And what's really, really cool about it is that everything is procedurally generated. So you play through it and, uh, a single playthrough maybe would take you about three or four hours. Uh, but what ends up happening is, is that you beat the game and you can start over again. You've unlocked a few new things that you can try out, a few new characters, a few new weapons. And, um, 
basically just start over again and everything will be completely different through your next playthrough. So it's really fun and it's easy to get lost in something like that. Aside from the procedural genera- ugh, the procedural generation, mm-hmm. uh, what what sets this one apart from other uh, strategy turn based strategy games like uh, Fire Emblem or um, well, uh, I guess I guess XCOM or something. I, I would say the the big thing is that it's really purely a stealth game. You really don't have the tools to. Uh, you know, kill guards and stuff. You can knock them out for maybe two or three turns, but you really just have to sneak your way through things. And, and the more attention you draw to yourself, then the worse things are for you. Cause you can, uh, end up with more guards spawning cause they know that you're there or you can have security cameras turn on and they'll track you down a lot more easily. Uh, and they even have things like, uh, robot drones that'll home in on you. It's, it's really, uh, a pure stealth kind of mechanic. You cannot just, go in guns a blazing because there really aren't any guns to speak of anyway. So I, I'm basically going to be the odd person out here. Uh, I've been playing Yokai Watch. Uh, we know. Several hours in, so. <laughs> I am not. It's, it's like I talk about <laughs> the games that I like and am playing in the chat room. <laughs> Sometimes. I know. I'm actually looking forward to uh, starting. I got a copy for Christmas, and I still haven't beaten uh, Pokemon Omega Ruby, so I'm kind of maybe just going to skip playing through the rest of that for now and actually just jump over to Yokai Watch. So no, it's 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 bizarre. It I, basically one of the reasons why I was even into this is in the first place is because I was hearing things that I was liking about it, specifically about the cartoon from someone whose name I won't speak of in front of Jason mm. here, who I enjoy listening to his opinions of, and Jason does not. <laughs> Basically, um, I, I, li- I like level five. I like the kind of weird, bizarre stuff they do. I like how they take these existing genres. I like how they blow out everything into big stupid shonen anime with insane stories and bizarre humor and to me the yokai watch kind of took some of the general ideas of pokemon you ca- you can't escape the pokemon comparisons with this it's yeah. not the same but it's different enough that i think that you can get a very different experience from it one of the big criticisms i have of pokemon is that in spite of all the quote character that it kind of has through all of its monsters and everything the way it plays and the way it builds a world is really kind of sanitary well like, yeah i have to agree. whenever they take one step forward it always feels like they take two steps back in heart gold soul silver hey you could have your pokemon walk behind you that's really mm-hmm. cool uh, let's get rid of that yeah, well they got rid of so one. much in black and white i was so mad you remember that don't you yeah well yeah they they bring in these little things that just are kind of fun little things and then they replace it with other fun little things and i mean it's good to experiment but at the same time it still feels like my monsters aren't necessarily the things that i can care about or get into it it just kind of feels like yeah these look cool and these are cool tools to me yokai watch is kind of a little bit more we'll say pokemon with character like it actually has a more yeah. built up story the the spirits that you befriend actually talk um you can you don't actually catch them you fight them and eventually if you give them food they like or if you have characters that they like then after you defeat them in battle sometimes they'll walk up to you and say hey I want to be your friend. Mm-hmm. You want to be my friend? I'll give you my medal. Oh, do you have to le- leave bread and milk? Because that's a very Japanese thing for ghosts or spirits. You have to, at the beginning of a battle, you have the opportunity to toss one piece of food at them. Mm. And sometimes it is bread <laughs> or milk. Uh, sometimes it's okay. like, there, there's like categories. Hey, you can toss Chinese food or ramen or a rice ball. <laughs> and It's a little bit of an undertale there, huh? <laughs> well, you can... Try the nonviolent option. No, you can't try the nonviolent option because after you throw them something you like, you still have to beat the crap out of them. Oh, the battle is still here's the some battle. food. I'm really gonna kick your butt. <laughs> you just have to make sure that by the end of it, 
Hey, I can I I like how you beat me up. Let's be <laughs> friends. It's not as mechanically dense as Pokemon. The the yokai, the spirits themselves, you don't control them per se. A lot of it is you kind of hanging back and controlling the flow of battle, where the yokai that you send out themselves just attack and do things autonomously, and they can attack, they can use special attacks, they can guard, they can inspirit, which causes special effects on opponents or friends. And it's your job to just kind of say, okay, this guy's losing HP, I've got to feed him or either rotate him out of battle. And, hey, this guy over here, he's charged up, I can summon his special attack, which activates a little mini game. If you get inspirited by an opponent, you have to drag someone to the back and then play a little mini game to kind of release them from being inspirited, that kind of stuff. So at the beginning, whenever you're just kind of managing things and you don't have much to manage, it's pretty slow to start. But by the end of it, you're really going to have to keep an eye on things, keep switching out your uh, spirits, keep playing these small mini games to make sure that they're not getting debuffed, that kind of stuff. Again, if you're kind of looking at Pokemon and saying, you know, this is a fun world, but I kind of want more from it, I think Yo-Kai, Yo-Kai Watch is a good game, but ultimately its biggest flaw is that a lot of the aspects of it are a little bit more random that I like. I've gotten a lot of frustration just getting the most expensive freaking piece of bread <laughs> saying, this is the thing that you like. I'm battling you trying to be your <laughs> friend. Be my friend. Uh, getting stabbed by the old random and numbers. It's on par with, hey, you've gotten your Mewtwo down to... 1%, you've got him asleep, oh, yeah. why won't you work uh, Ultra Ball, that kind of well, stuff. Well, that's why you got to save the Master Ball. I, I, enjoy, I enjoy it. I don't think it's a replacement for Pokemon, but I do definitely encourage people to, you know, if you, if you can watch that kind of weird shonen anime type stuff, it's, it's funny, it's stupid, it's bizarre, and it just has character that Pokemon does not have. So it's kind of a little bit like a situation comedy RPG. I mean, everything's done broken into like little episodes. So that's kind of good if you have a short attention span. You could just do one little story and then end for the day, you know. Yeah. Which is good for a portable game. That's that's very true actually. I was going to bring that up. Mm-hmm. And hey, the Yokai watch and actually have personalities, which is which is yeah, fun. Yeah. You know what? It's fun. <laughs> Nintendo, are you listening? That stuff is fun. You mean Tentacruel doesn't have a personality? He he ha- he has a personality that it directly affects his stats, and that's all it affects. And I think it's about time we move over to the spin cycle. So, in the spin cycle this month, uh, we're kind of looking at a recent Polygon interview, which, uh... Oh, no. It, it's... Yeah, I, I... Look, I know. It's Polygon. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying not to judge here, because I'm focusing more on the interview side of it, and not on the giant, huge uh, featurette that they kind of wrapped it around, which, I mean, I skimmed it. It's kind of a big long to do mostly about um hey we talked to the people who made or one of the directors of sonic boom or one of the creative people behind sonic boom and how happy he was with sega hey here's this history of how sonic kind of effed up and <laughs> here's weird art to go with it that kind of stuff so <laughs> but um i wanted to focus a little bit more on some quote pulls from uh izuka aka the current director of sonic team A.K.A. the guy who's in charge of all the Japanese Sonic games. I guess the first one, Reef, you have a beautiful man voice. Why don't you uh, play up our first quote from the Polygon article? No, I, you just cut here and there, so I, I think we lost Reef. Saber, you have a beautiful man voice. Why don't you take the uh, first quote? Izuka tells Polygon he hopes so- Sonic games will be a part of the solution by putting a greater emphasis on quality. So, this is uh, them pulling that old rabbit out of the hat. So, 
Jason, as someone who has been around the block a few times, about what number of statements is this? A uh, number of statements that said, oh, we're, we're going to really improve it this time. It's going to be better than before. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, they, they were saying this with their, like, apology letter earlier last year, too. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of a running thing with Sega. I, I mean, it, it almost builds by the thing I hate to talk about, the infamous JPEG of the Sonic Cycle, that, hey, Sega's saying stuff. Sega say, Sega saying, hey, 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 we're, we're really trying here. But at the same time, I kind of want to separate this out here because this is Izuka saying this. This isn't necessarily Sega saying this. And later quotes will kind of emphasize that a bit. Um, I mean, do we feel he has been? Do we feel that this promise is still being made to a point? Oh, uh, well... For Sonic Team, I think in the last eight years, they've done their best to put out a quality Sonic game. I mean, I, I always liked, I loved Sonic Unleashed. I thought that was a, you know, good game from not really Black Knight, so to speak, but I mean, Colors, Generations was good. Uh, Lost World was, uh, it was, it was solid, but it was very experimental and a, a little off, but otherwise not bad. It's just those other, a lot of those other Sonic games that aren't necessarily the best. Here's one thing that I really feel, uh, kind of puts this quote, over, it rakes the quote over the coals is what it does, is the fact that it's been made multiple times before to the point where we can joke about it. Uh, it may not necessarily have been Izuka every time, but the fact that it has come up in conversation from people that work on Sonic does not bode well necessarily for, uh, the, veracity of whether or not this is going to happen or not. They said for Sonic 06, it was going back to its roots. <laughs> so you can't always, uh, you know, judge what they say, right? Uh, well, it, yeah. it was also Yuji Naka saying, what if Sonic was in the real world? Like in Sonic Adventure and Sonic Adventure 2 or something. I, don't, I, 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 hate, I hate to be that <laughs> guy. And I'm, we'll I, get back to that I am later. Not saying he, I'm not saying Yuji Naka is the problem with past Sonic games, but <laughs> I am noting the fact that their upswing happened to coincide with when he left. Now, I'm not saying one thing led to another. I'm just saying, you know, that it is kind of coincidental. Something happened there. Something happened there. Correlation does not imply causation, but... Exactly. But correlation exists, we'll say. Yes, exactly. So, Reef, this yeah, our yeah. last quote kind of plays into this quote. Would you like to take this one? Sure. It says, He cites Rise of Lyric, explaining how the priority was put into shipping the title rather than quality and fan expectation. He also admits that Sonic Team wasn't, quote, deeply involved with the game's development. Isuka says that the Sonic Team wants to build a new internal standard for its products, giving the team the necessary resources to craft something that lives up to fans' expectations. Yeah, uh, I think... <laughs> Anyone who's been following Sonic Boom will probably agree with the first part of that statement. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that game did not feel like a Sonic Team game at all. It did not feel like a completed game at all. <laughs> right, right. Didn't feel like a Sonic game almost at all. And I think that really cuts the core of some of the problems with the Sonic franchise is that more often, not, not super duper often, but more often than should happen, they do try to ship the game over prioritize shipping them over completing the game and that's not something you should do that that is the big that is the crux of why i still like sonic but i have huge huge problems with sega and i abs the problem is a lot of what izuka is saying i believe he's actually being pretty sincere with this but at the same time, I have absolutely no faith and confidence in Sega as a company. <laughs> right, and that's the thing. I believe I believe Izuka has best of intentions. I don't think he wants to ship out games that are unfinished or uncompleted as um, 
as Jason could probably attest to, the end of um, mm-hmm. the end of the last major Sonic game, um, Sonic Lost Worlds, kind of has this big string of half finished level ideas at the end of it. I just think business is going to be business. Yeah, and whether he wants to or not, Sega has a really has a really strong bottom line they associate with Sonic. The thing is, this has happened enough times, and that the fact that they have to acknowledge this as being a problem, uh, it it just feels like this is their sort of half apology, and they're like, "Oh yeah, we'll, we'll definitely try harder next time. We promise." And I don't know, it just feels very insincere to me in a way. I, I mean, if you look at it, I don't think. A lot of the things that get said, like, this, this is Isika saying this. This is the software developer True. saying this. This is not the company saying this. And occasionally, you'll have someone like Aaron Weber come out and kind of mirror talk that. But at the same time, he doesn't actually control a lot of it. A lot of what's going on with development is all about Sega Japan. And it seems very rare that we get a lot of mm-hmm. statements out of them. It, does, does that seem accurate, uh, Jason? That's true. I mean, we've been getting a lot of different, like, apology statements from uh, Sega or say, saying they're going to try harder this time. But, I mean, a lot of a lot of those come from Sega of America or some of the developers. It, it's just very rare we get any real statements out of Sega Japan, isn't it? That's very true. We don't really get much. Jason, why don't you take the next quote? And this is actually coming from Izuka himself. Because Rise of Lyric tried a different take on, on Sonic from the norm, and considering the results, this made Sonic Team feel like we wanted to build a Sonic title which represents the evolution of the Sonic series over the last 20 years. I'll let you guys take your interpretation, but I have a rather strong interpretation of what this actually means. <laughs> I don't know, maybe a Generations 2 or something along that there line? There we go. There, I don't even have to say it. <laughs> If you look at the uh, the 25th anniversary logo stuff and the imagery they've been doing, it's classic Sonic, uh, modern Sonic, and Sonic Boom Sonic. And that's pretty much all they've been showing is those three Sonics. I- I'm going to read the next one, and it kind of plays into how I'm feeling about the series. Izuka continues, Though the character won't change, we do think that the game should always be open to evolving and constantly improving themselves. And whether or not you feel they're improving, it is a series where they take a lot of, uh, honestly, you might not see it, but they kind of do take a lot of creative risks in how they design. They do. They do start at the beginning again and just build something completely new. One game is very different from another game is very different from another game. If you look at Hero, Sonic Heroes is so different than the Sonic Adventure games. Sonic 06 is very different than Sonic Heroes. It's a little bit closer to adventure. The Sonic Storybook games just completely throw everything out the window. Sonic Colors is completely different than any of them. Sonic Generations takes a little bit of Sonic Colors, but also mixes in other elements and refines it all. Then Sonic Lost World just throws that all out the window. It's kind of a situation where I think a lot of people want them to pick something and stick with it and refine it, But at the same time, I also kind of appreciate that, you know what, I'm getting a Sonic game this year. It might not necessarily be the most refined, but it's going to be very different than the last Sonic game I played. Oh, yeah, but that could be both good and bad. I mean, I think they had a strong formula with the daytime unleash stages and color stages and generations. And I think that's a form. I think that's the formula that they should stick to, but evolve from there. And and I I acknowledge that. Like at the end of the day, I'm not I'm not trying to justify. Hey, this bad game is good because it's different. I'm just saying, you know what? Whether or not I like the game, Sonic and the Lo- Sonic Lost Worlds is a very it is something that I haven't played as Sonic before, and I wasn't a huge fan of it. But you know what? I'm happy I played it. I'm glad I had that experience. It definitely was something that challenged what I thought about Sonic. I don't know if I necessarily want them to stop. I think uh, stop experimenting. But I think ultimately for 
the sake of the franchise, it would, for people outside of me, it would probably be better if they did focus on a gameplay style that they refined more so than making every single one of them different. Right, that's kind of what I'm saying there. Right, which is kind of what you got whenever you looked at colors versus generations. So, the next part of the spin cycle here, I'm going to get into some other quotes. I have to preface this, though. <clears throat> okay. The quotes I'm about to read are from the Sonic Stadium message board from a user by the name of Van. I have no way of confirming that this person is actually associated with the upcoming 2018 Sonic the Hedgehog movie coming from Sony, which means everything I say, everything this person has said, take it with a grain of salt because this is the internet. Anyone can realistically say they are anyone, but you know what? The thread has been going long enough. TSSZ felt it was significant enough to report it, and while I don't always agree with their standards... <laughs> It gives us a good excuse just to frickin' talk about the movie. I mean, do you really need a good excuse to talk about the movie? In this case, yes. We need a good excuse to actually talk about the movie. Otherwise, I will not want to talk about the movie. <laughs> I will want to shove the movie into a little box and forget about it until it dies. Mm. So, we've got Van... We've got uh, Van Robert... Ugh, Robert Cho... Rabacho. Uh, someone can correct me in the comment section. I don't care. Whatever. Van. <laughs> Van is apparently a writer attached to the now twenty, the currently 2018 Sonic the Hedgehog live action and CG movie from Sony. He had a couple things to say about fan reaction to the very concept, to the directorial choices. We know the director is the same person who worked on uh, Smurfs 2. We know that the movie itself is going to be a combination of live action and CG. And much like uh, many other people, that scares the crap out of me. <clears throat> so mm, yeah. let, <laughs> let, let's hope he can provide at least a little bit of solace if he is who he says he is. Uh, Reef, let's go back <laughs> around to you. All right, it says, I completely understand the hesitation that many of the fans have had about the live-action component. It's a technique that has mixed success in the past. I think the movie will speak for itself and prove these concerns wrong. We aren't making Smurfs with Sonic. We're making Sonic the Hedgehog. I'm so excited about the movie as both a fan and as a writer who loves to tell awesome stories. Let's break this down a little bit now. Without using either the words Roger or Rabbit, mm -hmm. I'd like you to tell me another really good solid example of a very cartoony character in a live action scenario that has worked well. James Cameron's <clears throat> Avatar. Bed knobs and broomsticks. Paddington? Mary Poppins. Colossus and Deadpool. He's, he's, he's entirely CG and very cartoony <laughs> compared to... De Deadpool, I will give you. Deadpool, I will give you. Some of the others... It kind of goes with what I said about Yuji Naka versus uh, Izuka. Is that yeah. whenever Naka left, the series started to get a little bit funnier, a little bit cartoonier. I liked the artistic direction that Unleashed took. How <laughs> they weren't... If you look at Adventure, they were these as best as Dreamcast could rendered anime style tall people. Then we we right. get into Sonic Adventure Two, and it just kind of doubled down on that. Then right, we get into right. Sonic O Six, and we're looking at Final Fantasy dumpster rejects. <laughs> like like <laughs> like they just 
stole characters from The Sims and populated NPCs with them. And then we get to Izuka, and it's like, you know what? We kind of have this weird anime girl who lives in a ring. We have the weird wizard lady, but there's not much beyond that. We also have these weird other creatures. We've indoctrinated other Sonic characters to play these roles. We get to Sonic Unleashed. And Sonic Unleashed just throws everything out the window again and says, you know what? All these characters, just super cartoony. Make cartoons. Make Pixar humans, basically. Yeah, yeah. And what's great about it is, when they made Unleashed, they actually did make a cartoon. Yeah. Literally. They made cartoons... Based on those models and art style. I really liked those cartoons, actually. I thought they those were Those are probably my favorite bit of legacy from that game. And then we kind of look at Colors. Colors takes a very... Colors takes a very mm-hmm. um, comedic approach to it. It's, it's, it's silly. It's lighthearted. We go even further to Generations. Generations is hardly serious. It's not super funny. Yeah, that was, right. that, that was Pontac and Graf who... Personally, I thought they did a great job on colors. I haven't been really happy with anything they've done <laughs> since, to be honest. It's still better than them trying to grab the dark again. Yes, I'll agree with that. I like where Sonic is right now, tonally. And I have concerns about live action either going too far with that or in the exact opposite direction, that they attempt to make it a bit more serious. Because it's really hard to pull off cartoony comedy in the combined live-action and CG realm, as I've seen such so far. What what would you guys say? Do you, th- do you think that this is something that they'll be able to pull off? It's from the director of the uh, Smurfs, so... <laughs> no. So, this is going to be the worst idea you've ever heard, but I say they should go <laughs> make it rated R, because either you end up with something <laughs> like Deadpool, which is rated R, or you end up with something like Ted, which is also is rated R. Neither one lap. of those are what you should oh. be doing. But if they're going to make this terrible, and I think they're going to make it terrible... I, I, I think that I think the core thing is here is that they just need to get uh, John Oliver to voice Sonic. Well, that was what I was hoping for. That's exactly what I wanted to say. I think John Oliver should be Sonic. Are you sure he shouldn't be Tails, though? Because I feel like he'd be a better Tails. No, J- John Stewart has to be Tails. I was thinking like a uh, buddy cop comedy with uh, Tails. <laughs> <laughs> like, like Tails is going to be the streetwise character. That... Well, no, it doesn't make any sense at all, but sure, yeah. <laughs> as, a, as opposed to the rest of this premise. That's true, yeah, I know. Here's the problem with the whole humans interacting with them and whatnot, is they've done that in Sonic X, which was an anime, and it still <laughs> wasn't very good. They've done it in a lot of things yeah. where it wasn't very good. Like, all the games that I talked about... Yeah! Just- Sonic 06 may make sure it didn't work. I kind of look at Sonic Boom and... Even with that game's flaws, and, and kind of what the cartoon delivered on, you know, it works better when everyone's just a freaking animal. Yeah. 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 So, the ending of that quote, Saber. I think people who are worried this will be Alvin, Smurfs, Garfield are going to be very pleasantly surprised. No, they're not! <laughs> no. Uh... <laughs> the fact that you brought up those specific examples does not fill me with confidence. I will I will say this in the defense though. A bad movie is made with be- is always made with best of intentions, but is always a product of many many people. And a good movie is a miracle because all of the pieces yeah. have to come together. A lot of these other things they kind of fail because of mm-hmm. the writing. Let's let's be honest. A lot of the problems come down to premise and writing. If they can write a good Sonic film, then I think it makes it easier to direct a good Sonic film. But can they write a good Sonic film? That That is the thing that is <laughs> to be determined. Um, it is... It is ultimately, to me... 
what's going to make or break this. Like, I can complain day and night about, well, I don't like the style of this, I don't think it works with the world, the premise is bad, and I, I've done that for the last 15 minutes. There is no way anybody thought that, you know, you can make a film out of Lego as a property. That, that's very true. And then they go... And then they got the right people to do it, and they did it in the right way, and it came out. And it was still one of the best animated films of that year, it, in a pretty hotly contested year as well. Yeah, I mean, I guess I got to grant you some of these things. I mean, J- Jason, we haven't heard from you much. Like, what? where do you stand on the whole movie thing thus far? I think we lost Jason. He is probably somewhere. Jason promises three thumbs down. You heard it here first, folks. Yeah, I'm back. Oh, yeah. See, Gundam Build Fighters is saving the world with toys, and that was amazing. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, I had to go away for a sec. Sorry. So, so uh, Jason, where do you fall on the whole movie position right now? You, you kind of threw in... The same kind of cynicism that we had, but where where do you <laughs> yeah. legitimately stand? Well, like you said, the best every movie is uh, has good intentions behind it, but are marred with um, about a million bad decisions half the time. <clears throat> and I might think that might be the case. We're, we're talking about the, the, is it is the director of Smurfs doing this, correct? Smurfs two. We know it is the director of Smurfs two. Uh, I. I don't know who all of the writing staff is. And when you combine that with the fact that it's, you know, half CG and half live action, it kind of makes it hard to not end up, you know, bad in quality. Mm. It may may not be Smurfs too bad or even Garfield bad, but my hopes are not very high. There's not a good legacy of these movies. No. Yeah. Doesn't mean it couldn't happen, but, you know... For me, it's it's doubtful. It, 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 so- it basically sounds like we're all cautiously pessimistic. Actually, you know, it's really <laughs> kind of funny. The uh, the fact that both of these quotes are like, for, well, the one from Izuka and then the one from this guy, they're like, we're, we're going to definitely try to bring quality to the franchise. Uh, just stay tuned. You'll find out good things are John the Pike. I, I think that's going to wrap up this discussion. Again, there's a good reason to... Be hopeful, but equal as much reason to say, you know what? You told us this before. Please show, don't tell. There's, there's, I, a, I, there's I, a time when you leave the abuser. <laughs> Let's not get into that because then we're going to lose audience. <laughs> but my point is, we need Sega right now more than anything to show, not tell. And they started to do so. We need them to continue to do so, and whenever they do things like Sonic Boom, Rise of Lyric, it's really hard to take them at their word. So this kind of brings us into the Spin Box! Our always, always returning email section, and uh, basically we can summarize the Spin Box right now as... Email us your discussion questions, damn it! We need them! Fair enough. Plus, I like to read stuff in the spin box. We, we, we just, we want you to give us good discussion topics. Hey, if the discussion topic's good enough, we just might make it our main topic, but we like to discuss Sonic, and we want to know, hey, what do you want discussed about in the Sonic region, in the Sonic realm? Um, what do you want to know what do you want punditry on? Topics are easier to discuss than tumbleweeds. It's easier for a large quantity of people to come up with topics than it is for me to come up with topics all the time, unless something is super topical. And, of course, the all-important email you can send it to are, is the spin dash at gmail.com. Super easy. The spin dash, all one word, at gmail.com. Send us... Things you want us to talk about, things you like, things you don't like about Sonic, ideas about Sonic. Give us things that we could discuss for your pleasure. No fan fiction, please. Send us fan fiction as long as it's in two paragraphs. <laughs> they're going to be or the personas. They're going to be the longest paragraphs ever. Uh, so 
And finally, we're going to wrap up the show this month with Blast Processing. The Sega Genesis has Blast Processing. Super Nintendo doesn't. So what's Blast Processing do? Yes, Blast Processing, that little segment that we have always done ever, all the time, forever, that is just about something inconsistent, something non-existent, something that just isn't as important, much unlike Blast Processing in the Sega Genesis, which was the most important thing in the whole thing. And so I thought uh, for our introductory Blast Processing of the new Spin Dash Live format, I thought we would all make predictions about Sonic in 2016 and beyond. Do they have to be real predictions? <laughs> oh, no. Uh, they can be however you interpreted that. Okay. So, oh, boy. So, is there any volunteers to go first? Uh, I'll go first. Saber, by all means. I think that in the future, Sonic will... He will stretch his boundaries, and he will, you know, try different things out, experiment. I think Sonic that Unleashed 2 find... is what I'm hearing. I'm hearing LSD. Well, I was going to say he will... <laughs> I was going with that he might try another color but blue, but that's good. those are good interpretations, too. So Actually, in the upcoming Sonic talk, uh, Jason might have something to say about that. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, we're uh, doing back-to-back episodes tonight. <laughs> it should, should I go ahead and make my prediction, or does anyone yes, else want please. to? Yes, please. I'll, uh, I'll say that I think with the 25th anniversary thing going on right now, it's not just going to be... One Sonic game with uh, all three characters, although I think that's a strong possibility. But I think we'll see at least one Sonic game each from the different like genres. I th- I think there's a good possibility we may see another 2D Sonic game out this year. And I'm pretty sure the reason that they uh, delayed Sonic Boom Fire and Ice is just so we can have a Sonic Boom game out during the... 25th anniversary, 25th anniversary of Sonic yeah, itself. I was think of that. I'm actually going in the opposite direction. And I'm basing a lot of this on the art that they provided. I bet, or I, well, I'm not going to bet this, but my prediction for this year is that <clears throat> they are going to have a, tw- a another anniversary game in in the same vein of Sonic Generations. And I believe that it may play in different ways. It won't necessarily be a beat 'em up and take advantage of all those different ways. But I think it will have classic Sonic, modern Sonic, Sonic Boom. And if I'm really, really stretching, I'm almost thinking it's possible they could bring in elements of comic Sonic. Which they have actually officially named Conic, Son, Comic Sonic now. I thought you were going to say Mega Man. <clears throat> Isn't Comic Sonic just a lot like regular Sonic? He's better written. <laughs> that is true. <clears throat> I, yeah, but I'm, I'm talking like Comic Sonic would actually have elements of the world. Although I think the only elements that they would take out of that world are the main cast. Sally. Yeah, basically the main cast. <laughs> Sally, mostly. <laughs> Given, yeah, this is yeah. my wild prediction. This but is, the main this cast is, my, is good. Hey, GX is off his meds, saying crazy things onto <laughs> the internet. <laughs> that that this. That's not entirely fair. It, there, I shouldn't degrade people who take medication for... You get what I mean. But yeah, I, I think that. I think we will probably see more Sonic Boom uh cartoons closer to the uh, fall season. That'll be nice. I I actually really enjoy the Sonic Boom cartoon. I think we will see leaked artwork and possibly stills of the Sonic movie, but we will not see anything along the lines of a trailer or a teaser until next year. One other thing I'd like to add is I think this is going to be a good year for Sonic games, especially compared to 2015, but I think 2017 is going to be another crap year. We know of at least two so far. We know Fire and Ice, and we know the next Olympic game. I'm going I'm going to put another prediction out there. I think the next Olympic game is going to be all right. I think it's going to be a <clears throat> I think it's going to be a 
pretty okay, good Olympic game. To be coming. honest, the 3DS <clears throat> one doesn't look half bad. Yeah. I, I think it, nah, I think it's going to be the best one we've had since the first Winter Olympics game. I like that prediction, though. I, I like. I certainly like prediction based on, hey, this game might be good. <laughs> Reef, I don't think you contributed. Give us your wild, crazy prediction. My wild, crazy prediction is that Sonic the Hedgehog is going to come out in support of the Donald Trump presidential campaign because Sonic has had it up to here with illegal aliens invading his planet and trying to kill him and all of his friends. Hey, you know <laughs> what? Sonic loves aliens. That's why he merges with them in every game ever since Sonic Colors. And he certainly is not in favor of building walls between him and where he wants to go. And Sonic absolutely sides with the Pope because he is super Catholic. <laughs> what? He eats hot dogs on... Nah, I, I, get, I, guess, I guess you're right. He is probably a bit more Jewish. I mean, you can, you can tell he's been circumcised all the way. Oh! That's not circumcision. That's... that's- Ah, oh. uh, yes. Oh, so, I wish that my my audio hadn't cut out. I would have loved to have heard what any of that had to do with anything. Don't don't worry. You didn't miss anything Except important. Except for, you know, dismemberment. That's the best kind. <laughs> so, I I think with that, um I I think yeah, we're we're going to cut out for the evening and uh, I hope you enjoyed our first Sonic Live episode. I know episode. I did. Uh, given that we haven't had any viewers, it hasn't been very live, but you're going to be able to catch it in podcast form. When I say that, you're probably listening it to it in podcast yeah, form. who cares? So, uh, hey, until next time, uh, I'm GX, he's Reef, she's Saber, and he's Jason. And uh, this has been Dash. Until next time, we're up, over, and gone. Peace out, people. Bye. Bye. Adios. Well, because they're saying it's not going to be the Smurfs, but we all know better. <laughs> I mean, it's literally not going to be the Smurfs. There there certainly will not be a blue protagonist in it. <laughs> going into a real world that he doesn't have a lot of business being in. So... <clears throat>